I'm Scott. I'm Rim. We are the host of Geek Nights. It is a podcast. If you enjoy this, there are thousands of hours of us doing this online for free. I don't know why you'd want to go listen to it, but it's there. At least someone has. And today, we're going to talk about nostalgia because we, everyone who comes to a PAX, everyone who plays games. Not young people. Young people are too young to have nostalgia. Even young people have nostalgia for younger times. <laughs> you, have, you know, you're playing with your Legos and you're like, yo, man, remember Duplos? <laughs> Duplos were good stuff. <laughs> I wish I had some Duplos. Uh, like, for example, I like the game Aerobiz. I'm probably the only person- Is there person any single person here other than that one clapping guy? <laughs> <laughs> I have deep nostalgia for a game on the Super Nintendo where you literally play the CEO of an airline and call board meetings and look at sales projections. <laughs> like, I am not in any way exaggerating what this game is about. <sighs> but nostalgia is a funny thing because the definition of nostalgia, like what this word means, it's sort of that it's sentimental, it's wistful, it's an affection for something in the past, but more importantly, it's a, it's a, we're looking for the associations, the feelings we had, not necessarily the things themselves, and we might not even remember those things that well. I don't know if I want to play Aerobiz today. So in gaming, Gaming, video games in particular, haven't even been around that long. No, what was a video game invented? Like the 80s? They're barely older than me. Yeah, right? there are probably people at this PAX who played the first video game. I mean, movies aren't out. even that old. Movies are maybe like 60, 70 years older than me, right? It's like, wow. You know? People yeah. think like, oh, that's an old movie. It's like, the movie was made when like your grandpa was young, probably, <laughs> right? So you'll get these situations like Windjammers where a game will get popular in a certain time, a certain place, and people kind of get obsessed with it. And now we're in an era where we're getting these second and third phases where the games industry is going back and mining games that were previously popular and trying to bring them back because there's a lot of money and nostalgia if you haven't noticed. Right. It's not just in gaming. It's, not, it's sort of obvious, you know, at least in the U.S. culture, right, just how much mining of nostalgia there is relative, you know, it, you know. I don't have numbers on this, right? But everyone sort of gets this general feeling like, hey, over time, you know, it seems like there's a lot more remakes, redos, and comebacks these days than versus, say, in the 90s, right? There were, seems like there were more original things. You know, if you go and look at, like, go to Google and you can just type in, like, movies from year, and it'll show you across the top, like, you know, posters of all the movies. And if you do it, just take a little thing and be like, all right, how many of these were new and how many were remakes? And then do it for, like, 2018, and it's, yeah. You're gonna see. You'll also start to feel pretty old when you realize how long ago movies that you don't think are that old are from. Oh, it's that 20th anniversary of thing when you were a teenager. Oh my god. So we all, like, everyone who played the N64 Goldeneye, really, like, they think back to that as being a really good time. And we're gonna explore over the course of the next hour what's really going on there. Because a lot of the things that we might think we have nostalgia for, it wasn't necessarily the game itself that is worth bringing into the future. So let's start with remakes and sequels. Like, what is a sequel? What is a remake? What makes a remake work? And it so happens that a while ago, there was the perfect storm. There's a game on the Nintendo Entertainment System called Bionic Commando, popular in the speedrunning community, popular in its day. Popular because, in Rim's house, which is why it's on this panel. It's like the only game I've ever played where I'm within maybe 20 minutes of a speedrun record. 20 minutes is very far from a speedrun. The run. record is like 20 minutes, so double that and that's about what I can do. Okay. But Bionic Commando was a very popular game, and it got remade. It actually got kind of remade in two ways. So this was a while ago, but basically Vita Command, this Nintendo game, was remade, faithful to the original, sort of as a promotion for a 3D, more serious AAA-style remake. Right, so they were, they were remaking Bionic Commando, a property, a Capcom property that had only been used once. There was one game of it ever. Well, right? there was a Game Boy version of Bionic Commando. That doesn't count, right? They were, re, they were taking that same story, right? The same characters, the same universe, making a brand new 3D game with it, that you, right? And then, to promote that game, they were like, let's remind people what the original Bionic Commando was like. So they also made Bionic Commando Rearmed, which was almost kind of identical to the original game. It was like a two and a half D game and it played had the same maps as the original game, you know, had the same right 2D action going on. And the promotional cheap to develop game that was a remake of the original sold way, way more than the, their high, high budget. Those are the ones. first week sale numbers for these two games. So a AAA game and basically a marketing tool. And it's very worth noting that Bionic Commando rearmed, it was the only one that actually got a sequel. So they made a sequel to the remake. So what was the deal with Bionic Commando? Like, we need to explore. Like, what was good about Bionic Commando? Why did this happen? 
And this is often a difficult question to answer. If you're making a 3D remake, it looks like someone thought that the great storyline of Bionic Commando and these characters everyone remembers was the deal. But no one really cared about Bionic Commando for the characters. No, and you know, it was such a poorly translated game that I think people, especially in the United States, didn't even know the characters or what was going on. Also, the characters were just literally guy with hook and Nazis. Yep. I mean, as a kid, I thought the guy in the middle was Super Joe, and you really couldn't tell playing the game. You had to read the manual to know, and the manual wasn't that great either. Like, nobody's cosplaying as Destroyer 3. <laughs> I need hair to be Destroyer 3. Now, it also had a bitchin' soundtrack. Mmm. And it's worth noting that they fully recreated that soundtrack with modern technology in the remake. So the soundtrack was really good, but you're not going to remake a platformer just because it had a good soundtrack. Right. You know, you could take the Mega Man 2 music and put it on, uh, like, tic-tac-toe. That's not going to work. <laughs> it might work a little. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> A lot of kids were introduced to the fact that Hitler is in this game and didn't really know what was going on with that. So the game almost had the sort of mystique or infamy. I mean, someone says a swear word and then Hitler shows up and then Hitler explodes. And you're a kid and you're playing this NES game and you're like, wait, was that Hitler? Yes, what? yes it was. And you tell your friends they wouldn't believe you? Well, because it was in the Japanese version, it was obviously Hitler. The and in the American version, it was like... Wink, wink, it's Hitler. You're yeah, dead. the game was originally called Hitler no Fukatsu, like Hitler's that, rebirth. Yeah, the original name was not Bionic Commando. <laughs> so, was it the gameplay? Yes, it was the gameplay. The gameplay is why this game was remade and why the remake was successful as opposed to the IP-driven spiritual successor. Right, there have been platforming games for a long time. There have been platforming games where you also have a gun, like Contra. Bionic Commando is basically just Contra, except you have this hook that you can swing on. Instead right? of jumping. Right. You cannot jump. All you can do is walk left and right, crouch, and use this hook. And the hook was actually, for an NES game, surprisingly flexible, right? You think about, like, you know, the whip in Castlevania on the NES. You could only whip, like, this way and that way. But on the Castlevania 4 on the Super Nintendo, you could dangle it and swing it all around like a lasso <laughs> and do all kinds of craziness, right? The hook in Bionic Commando for an NES game was shockingly versatile. You could go up, you could sort of get an angle and do a little Spider-Man, or right? you could do all this crazy stuff with it, and that made this game stand out from every other platformer since, maybe? Now this is where we're gonna go the rest of this panel, we're gonna go deeper, because you can't just say, oh, it was the gameplay. The gameplay was good, let's just remake the gameplay. It just so happened that Bionic Commando had a really good set of gameplay, because gameplay has many different components. There were boss fights in Bionic Commando, they weren't actually that good, and you'll notice in the remake, they completely redid the bosses because the boss mechanics kind of sucked. Also, weren't like some of the bosses repeated and lame? Yep, that yeah. Pippa Pig guy, you could just stand behind him and shoot him in the butt and he would just die. Like, he couldn't even hit you. <laughs> the game was super frustrating and super difficult relative to kids who were playing it at the time. Yeah, I cannot beat Bionic Commando 1 easily. It would take a while. Yep, and they recreated that, but it wasn't too difficult. You've all played games like Silver Surfer that were too difficult, and if you just remade Silver Surfer today, no one would play it. Right, Bionic Commando Rearmed is somewhat challenging. I'm sure people who aren't really good at games might not be able to beat it, but it is way easier than actual Bionic Commando. Even though you're nominally on like the same map with the same hook that operates the same way, just the controls and the feel of it and the visual and the timing and the spacing, right? It's like, that looks like the same level, but how come I can beat that part so easily in Bionic Commando Rearmed and not so easily in original Bionic Commando? Because they shinied it up, right? They polished that turn. So it was basically that hook, and it got to the point with this hook that when they, that made, animation on the when they made the remake, they actually had to reverse engineer things like how fast does he swing? How fast does the arm go out and retract? All the physics from the NES era, you know, before there were physics engines, it had to be recreated perfectly because it just so happened Bionic Commando was the easiest possible game on Earth to remake. It's one of the rare NES games that was basically perfect for its era and really just needed some polish. They just polished it up, made that guy really funny looking, and made a really great game just by copying something that was already great. Sometimes you can get away with that. So let's talk about two situations where that did not work. Has anyone played ActRaiser 1? Anyone? Anyone, anyone. Okay. So anyone I think it was made famous because ActRaiser 2 just got an SGDQ right. or an AGDQ speedrun. It did, that was a great speedrun. Go back that and watch was. it. Anyway, everyone who's played ActRaiser knows that in ActRaiser 1, there's two parts to the game, right? There's a town part, which is on the left there, where you're like, it's sort of like SimCity, Greek God kind of thing. I don't want to explain it all right now. 
And then there's a sideways action game where you walk left and right, you jump, you swing your sword, and kill guys. They were both kind of mediocre. Right, you like, had to do both of these games. It's like, it was like two games in one, which is why it was such a great deal, right? And personally, I like the town part a lot better than the walk sideways part, because the walk sideways part was sort of unremarkable, right? There's a lot of action platforming games where you swing a sword. Demon Sword, Ninja Gaiden, and this is way worse than Ninja Gaiden, way worse. So this game was really popular. But it seems like what happened is that the people responsible for the game didn't actually understand why it was popular. It was so popular that they made a sequel, a big budget sequel. Mm -hmm. And in that sequel, they decided that the thing people liked about this game was not the you are God, play like low rent Sim City, and then also go into that city and fight monsters. It was just make a generic platform or make like ghouls and goblins with some jumping. Right, now the ghouls and goblins with some jumping makes for a great speed run. It made for, in my opinion, not the greatest game. I knew kids who bought ActRaiser 2 and couldn't figure out how to unlock the town part. Right. I mean, how disappointed would you be if you bought, like, Bionic Commando Remake and it only <laughs> didn't have the hook? Right? It's just, <laughs> uh, it's just the talking to Nazis part. <laughs> <laughs> So another instance where this happened was WarioWare, the WarioWare franchise. At least I'm talking about the US sales and US audience specifically. The height of WarioWare was probably on the GameCube. Right, so WarioWare was originally a GBA deal where everyone knows you play, like, I hope everyone knows, you play like these cool, really short mini games and you play a lot of them really fast and it's a whole load of fun. But on the GBA, right, the original WarioWare games, this was an entirely single player experience. Sort of like, you know, think, think like when you play on your phone today, right? It's like a really good phone game, but we didn't have phones that could play good games then. Yeah, right? so they were actually great if you were pooping. Right, they were just like the perfect pooping game, but it wasn't like legendary, right? What was legendary and what sold the most was the GameCube game, WarioWare Incorporated, which included competitive multiplayer. So the deal is that this part was fun, but it wasn't fun enough. People didn't care that much about these kinds of micro games. Some people did. Some people did, and that like it sold well, but this was the magic because they added a whole meta layer on top of real-time competitive multiplayer, and there were a million different pretty complicated modes to make this happen. The game was designed for people sitting in the room together playing a kind of frantic multiplayer versus game. All right, and thanks to the magic of the GameCube, you could have four controllers on one TV, right? Everyone would get in on it like it was Smash Brothers, right? And you were all playing these tiny mini games together, trying to do them better than your friends, faster than your friends, and then there was like a meta game wrapped around them to see who the actual winner was. So this was the simplest mode, the disco mode, which is pretty much if you fail three times, you lose your crowd and you're out, and the last person standing is the winner. Uh, but the turtle mode... Turtles is the way to go. This was the best mode. The way it worked is as you lost at games, you would get more turtles under your butt, and it would become unstable like a Jenga tower. And in between each round, you had to stabilize your turtle stack to see if you could continue playing. Oh, and when you die, you turn into a turtle and you're running around biting the bottom of whoever's turtle stack beat you. Yeah. So they added, they added a pretty complex multiplayer game, and that multiplayer game just used the micro games themselves as sort of the currency to make the real multiplayer game work. Right. And we this played game did really the well. hell out of this. We played this for years. Like I the think entire I, life of the GameCube since this game came out, we played this like anytime we got together with people. There is only one other game on earth I have more nostalgia for than this game, and we'll talk about it later. The only thing that was able to unseat this as the local multiplayer go to was Jackbox. Until Jackbox, it was all WarioWare Incorporated. Perfect. So Sales-wise, this WarioWare seemed to be the highest-selling WarioWare in the U.S. It was all downhill from there, partly because of competition from phones, partly because none of them enabled multiplayer well. If they had multiplayer, it was kind of hacked in, didn't work that well, didn't facilitate the specific experience that the audience of this game liked, which happened to be sitting in a room with a bunch of people playing micro games together. Right. That, that one good part in Mario Party that you're trying to get to constantly. Right. When WarioWare came out for the Wii, we were so excited. I pre-ordered that biz. It came right away. Right, and We're like, oh my god, it's going to be all the fun of WarioWare for GameCube. There's seven different multiplayer modes and it, plus you'll be mixing in the, the Wii mote, right? We're gonna be doing like swinging stuff and all kinds yeah, of Yeah, I'm gonna have to pull that snot back into her nose manually. Right. It's gonna be great. But actually, what ended up happening in WarioWare for the Wii, all those multiplayer modes were garbage. They were not good. They were barely there. So there's another situation. We'll get, we're gonna continue on. This is the game I have the, the most nostalgia for ever. What about the situations where there's a thing that a huge number of people assume obviously should be remade, was a peak gaming experience, and yet it never gets remade. Like, why does that happen? How many of you 
actually read Penny Arcade. Okay, okay. So we you know this is the Penny Arcade Expo. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you understand that until recently, Tribes 2 was this, this giant FPS game where you're flying around as a right. dude even, with guns. Even today, no game compares to the early 2000s Tribes 2. This is a game where you can literally have 70 people playing together on an enormous map, like so 35 versus 35. Was it really that many? You might be misremembering this a, a little bit. It was a lot. You it could, was not 70 due to nostalgia, you see? Even we're vulnerable. It was a large number, larger than Counter Strike or anything. But like not that. 70. It was a lot. You could also you could play this on a 56k modem and it worked. Well, because most of us had 56k modems back then. That was a long time ago. I know, right? Yeah. Also, but, you could just walk, you could get into vehicles, right? You could you could bomb things. There was so much you could set up little turrets. Like the amount of stuff you could do in this game is insane. You have, everyone has a jetpack. It's ridiculous. So I got to take you back to an earlier time when we'd be in college and I'd be skipping class playing Tribes 2 and Scott would come home from class and skip his next class and just sit down and start playing Tribes 2 and then I'd skip my next class. I basically just played Tribes 2 for an entire year instead of going to class. I ran around to like three different game stores the day this came out to try to find it on CD-ROM. And we weren't the only ones obsessed with this game because Penny Arcade, up until like maybe five or six years ago, this was probably the game Penny Arcade had talked about more. I think before World of Warcraft came out, this was the game that had the most Penny Arcade comics. Like, I don't think you really understand. They talked about this for years and years and years. And then that's, they... my, that's the best one. <laughs> because the game was infamous for patches would come out and every patch made the game worse. Right, so I don't know if you understand. So, Tribes 2, in the game, oh, that's also the best one. <laughs> there was a forum for the game in the game. It wasn't like a separate website. And people there would say, oh, you should change this, you should change that, you should change this. And unlike most game developers who ignore all the fans who tell them what to do, they actually did what the players told them to do, and the game went, Ee! Now, the players who were the most vocal were nostalgic for Tribes 1, which wasn't that good. And they wanted Tribes 2 to be more like Tribes 1. But if you made it more like Tribes 1, only Tribes 1 kind of people will play it. Kind of like how there's an era where more people were playing old Counter-Strike than new Counter-Strike. The other players who were the most vocal were the ones who weren't that good at the game. And they would say, uh, ban this, I keep losing to it. It's ban the spin fuser. Yeah, just, uh, you know, make that thing go slower, I can't hit it, it's not fair. And then they would do, right? So what happened is they kept patching the game and ruining it and ruining it and ruining it. And then once there were no more players, they made one final patch to reset everything. And then the game died. So the game was really popular, and the last time Penny Arcade talked about it, the joke was basically someone released a trailer of a game that looked like it had some tribes-like mechanics in it, and they were like, why would you do that? There's no way you're actually making tribes. They're still nostalgic for this game as much as we are. A lot of people are, and it turns out a lot of games have been made by multiple studios that are very similar to Tribes 2. There's even games with the Tribes license. Tribes Ascend came out. Is it still going, maybe? I doubt it at I this know. point. There are a lot of Tribes ga games with or without the Tribes license that are basically trying to be Tribes. You have a jetpack, you have the spin fuser gun that shoots blue discs of death, or you have a giant map with hills that you ski on, right? You have vehicles, maybe. There's a lot of games that try to do this. They're all garbage compared to something made in the early 2000s. Well, are they garbage? Because the thing here isn't, are these games good or bad? A lot of them are actually great games. The problem is, what's wrong with us? Why can't we scratch this itch? Why do I look at all these games that are 90% Tribes 2, and I'm just like, ah, oh, it's not enough. It doesn't do it. It doesn't quite do it. That is literally the joke in one of these things a while ago. Oh, this other Tribes game doesn't quite do it. I don't know what to do. So there's something going on here, and we're going to get back to that. we got to talk more about what a remake actually is. Where do games come from? And I want to use a really interesting example of what eventually led to Overwatch, which came up a lot in the Q&A today. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, that's, that's the hot game these days, the one people talk about the most. So the lineage of games is important because games don't get made in a vacuum. Games borrow from other games. Some games aren't actually sequels or remakes to previous games, but people who liked those games use elements from those games to make their own games. So games have this evolutionary lineage, and you can trace core elements as they get brought forward over the years. Quake, back in the day, had a capture the flag mode. Mm -hmm. Quake 2 had a capture the flag mode. And in this old era, there were all these games that kept evolving on this. You had capture the flag, you had Team Fortress, you had Mega Team Fortress, Team Fortress Classic. And this all eventually culminated in probably the last game of that core genre, Weapons Factory. If you ever played Weapons Factory, it is ridiculous. It makes Overwatch look very simple. 
Yeah, even though this really the graphically doesn't look good, mechanically, the way the game works, there's like a zillion classes, they have a zillion different weapons, you can choose which hand you're throwing grenades from, you have to write scripts to throw grenades with one hand while you're shooting guns with the other hand, right? Also, this game is fast, really fast. Like, you can go across the whole map in like a few seconds, right? Rocket jumping, grappling hooks, like anything you can imagine is in this game. It's a weapons factor, you can make any weapon there. So, there's a million key bindings, a million characters. The game is so complex that you could really only learn it by having someone teach it to you. You had to learn scripting, all this nonsense. And this is kind of the style of game that Overwatch eventually became. This game got remade a couple times in the modern era, and we'll get to that. But there's another game I want to talk about, because sometimes the gene lines of two games merge. See, maybe, maybe you play Counter-Strike. There was a game that came out long before Counter-Strike. A that few was a, years before. Yeah, it was not a, long before. Long in the span of games. Two or three years. In the span of when I was in high school Maybe. playing games. Yeah. <laughs> Action Quake 2 was a mod of Quake 2 that basically made it proto Counter Strike. Right. It's called Action Quake because it was meant to like replicate what it's like to be in an action movie, right? Jumping through windows, driving cars, right? All, you think about the things that happen in action scenes and action movies, chase scenes, right? That's what they were going for. So those are sort of the things you could do in Action Quake. Multiple people who worked on Overwatch have said in interviews repeatedly that Action Quake 2 is one of the primary sources of inspiration for Overwatch. And Action Quake 2 was a game that was played very heavily by the exact same group of people that played Weapons Factory. Like, it was the same class. Yeah, this is Quake 1, by the way. That's why. No, that is Quake 2. Is it? I thought this, Weapons these are Factory both is on Quake 1. Weapons Factory. Well, all right, old man. <laughs> okay. So Team Fortress and Mega Team Fortress were on Quake 1. Team Fortress Classic was on the Half-Life engine. Yeah, it was that. garbage. Get that nonsense. <laughs> Get that out of here. And Weapons Factory was on Quake 2 and Quake 3. Oh. Many people don't remember that because no one played it. It didn't <laughs> scratch that itch, even though it was better in almost every way. Didn't scratch it for me either. So where did Overwatch come from? Well, look at Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike took... The core of this game. Right, Action Quake 2, that was the game where you died and didn't spawn again until the next round. Where the weapons were realistic. Right, and it's like Action Quake 2, that wasn't the primary feature of Action Quake 2. The primary feature of Action Quake 2 was, it's like an action movie. The primary feature of Counter-Strike was, when you're dead, you don't come back until the next round. So they took the aesthetic, the feel, like the way the game works, and that's basically what evolved into Counter-Strike, those kinds of games. But... Overwatch took a very different element from this. It took the feelings evoked in gameplay. It took that experience of there aren't a lot of controls, or at least they're not that complicated. You can dive in, and the action starts immediately, but they dropped all this other nonsense. You don't have to have 18 different kinds of turrets for the Marine to throw out, independent of the engineer. It was actually four kinds of turrets. 18 just sounds like a bigger and scarier number. It's still a big and scary number. So Counter-Strike ended up going on to have its own crazy thing. And the fact that Counter-Strike is still one of the most widely played games and is still like a serious esport is kind of amazing. This is a total aside, but when I was making this panel, I found a slide from one of our Lost Geek Nights panels. We did a talk at PAX West back in 2010 okay. about, we called it egregiously unrealized potential. And we were looking at old games that no one had ever remade, like XCOM. And saying, why doesn't someone remake XCOM? Oh, it's a travesty crap. that no one's remade. Almost XCOM. everything we talked about that panel has since been remade. <laughs> but I found this slide, and it's sort of interesting to the popularity of Counter Strike that the core elements that the people who made Counter Strike borrowed from games like Action Quake 2 were so strong for gamers that Counter Strike remains popular to this day. And in 2010, Two different versions of Counter-Strike were both the number one and number two game played on Steam total. That's kind of crazy. So Team Fortress 2 also comes from this exact same lineage. Remember we, we kind of made fun of Team Fortress? Team Fortress Classic was the game that actually most people played because, well, arguably it wasn't as good as well, Weapons Factory. it came Factory. for free when you installed Half-Life. It was like just there. Yep, right. and it just worked. You didn't have to be a weird nerd writing scripts to make your grenades work. The game just worked. Mm -hmm. Team Fortress 2 could have been Overwatch. It could have been the game that blew up the world and it started to blow up the world. Then it started to fade. Yeah. I was so excited because my nostalgia. You thought about taking a day off work when Team Fortress 2 came out. <laughs> That's not even a joke. I was going to take the day joke. off. We were like, we've been waiting so long for Team Fortress 2. You have no idea. Because all I wanted was to relive that experience from my childhood that I had playing Weapons Factory. Team Fortress 2 was the first game in modern history that was going to give me that experience again. 
All those other games we talked about, the weapons factories, those are all like free mods made by the community, right? The only games that you bought were Quake 1, Quake 2, Quake 3, Half-Life. You didn't buy any of those. They're all mods. Team Fortress 2 was the first. Someone spent a lot of money to develop this Team Fortress for you, and that's why it was like, oh my god, this is amazing. So these games are superficially similar. There's flags you have to capture, or objectives you have to achieve, or payloads you have to move. You've got classes that have different kinds of weapons, but we gotta get into the deep details of fundamental game mechanics to see why these games, despite being from the same lineage, inspired by the same things, even based on the same properties in such to some degree, ended up being so widely different and having such a, such a widely different fan base. Team Fortress 2 brought a lot of elements from these old games, like ammo. Characters have ammo that can run out, and you have to go replenish that ammo somewhere. That was a big part of old Team Fortress ga games, old Weapons Factory games. Right. And all those things, they bar the solution for those things, they pretty much just borrowed from all those old games. You went back, you had a little safe zone you could go to, and there was ammo there. Right? But what's that mechanic actually do in a game? It slows the game down. It adds extra work you have to do in the game that isn't the fun part to get to the fun part. It wasn't fun to run back to the base and stand somewhere and get your ammo back. It wasn't fun to be fighting on the front line and be low on rockets and have to give up and retreat. That might have made the game more realistic. It might have you know, satisfied some game designer's desire to make the game play a certain way, but the reality was it slowed down the pace of the game and limited the part that was fun. Because the part that was fun was shooting rockets at someone forever. Right, and you, know, you just think about it, like some of those things, like just having ammo, that's, the reason you had ammo is because, well, Wolfenstein 3D had ammo, and then Doom had ammo, it was like part of the game engine, like you didn't even consider when you're designing your game, especially because you're making a mod on that engine, you don't even consider like, what if we just don't have ammo, that's like, that doesn't even cross your mind, you're thinking about other things, like what's the map going to look like, right? So Overwatch went with a more modern mechanic. They dropped the idea of ammo. You don't run out of rockets and now you're screwed. You just have the sort of the clip, the local ammo that is infinite. So instead of running out of ammo and having to run somewhere and do something, you run out of ammo in this two second exchange where you have to decide when do I hit reload, but you never have to go through this longer ritual. So it made the beats of the game closer together. It made the game faster, it made the game more engaging, and it thus made the game more like Action Quake 2. Right, by making, they did a game mechanic Mechanically, right? They went completely outside the box, completely nothing like what was done before, but actually somehow the feel ended up being more like what was done before. So another difference between these two, a very specific detailed difference, was that Team Fortress 2, pretty much all the characters have a shotgun. They have their special weapon, a couple of special weapons, and they have like a basic weapon. So as a result, all the characters have this sort of default option they can use to do damage. Because that's how all those other games worked. Weapons Factory, all those old games, everybody had a shotgun and 20 other nonsense weapons. As a result, the characters felt a lot samier than their character design might appear. They look very different. They all have a very different special weapon. The special weapon runs out of ammo, and everyone in the end's just got a shotgun. Overwatch just said, screw that. This character has a completely different set of weapons. This character is literally just a ball rolling around on the stage. Like, they made everything really different. Why did everyone have a shotgun in Team Fortress 2? Because everyone had a shotgun in Weapons Factory. Why did everyone have a shotgun in Weapons Factory? Because it was a Quake mod. <laughs> the point of all that is that if you're gonna look at these kinds of games, remakes, nostalgia, anything, you really have to distill games down to very fundamental components to be able to have that conversation, to be able to understand what it is about a game that you liked, that was fun, that made the game work. Mm -hmm. And you also have to understand by separating it all out, kind of like when you make moonshine. Some of the stuff that comes out of that still is super poisonous. And some of the stuff that comes out is the fun kind of poison. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta balance between the two. A lot of times, if you make moonshine wrong, you get some of the bad poison in with the good. If you just take some old game and say, oh, characters had triple jumps in this game, so I'll just add triple jumps to my game. Maybe triple jump wasn't why people like that game, and now everybody's blind. Right, I mean, when I was a kid, right, like super young, before my memory... They like my moonshine joke. Uh, when I was, before my memory was very good, I watched T-Man. I had He-Man action figures, I had Masters Universe I action too. figures. I too, I too. You too watched He-Man. Well, I mean, I don't know if anyone else is here is old enough to have watched He-Man. Don't watch He-Man. Okay, yeah. Don't. Right, I didn't, because the technology level of the day, there was no internet, no nothing, I did not see or hear any He-Man again until I was in college and I had internet and said, 
oh man, there's internet now. I got an idea. I can go back and watch that He-Man. And in my brain, because I'm a stupid animal, just like everyone else, my brain had good things associated with He-Man because I watched it when I was like three. So then I found a He-Man video and I started watching it. And I was like, wow, this is bad. <laughs> right? It's like I had a good feeling associated with it, so my brain wanted more. But I didn't remember that actually the thing I wanted more of wasn't actually that good. I just had a good feeling associated with it for some other who knows what reason, right? So to people, when things get remade these days, there seems to always be this like cultural conflict that occurs with every single remake and every single medium and every single genre of, no, you're changing that thing. I want the exact same thing as before unchanged. And that's usually someone who remembers the original thing and actually liked it for what it was versus people who have a good feeling associated with the original thing, but when you remake it, you gotta make something different and better, otherwise they're going to hate it. And that's when you get like, you know, a Voltron or a She-Ra or something, right? Where it's like, ah, yes, if we make the original again, only these weird nerds will like it. <laughs> we need to make something new and just keep the same characters so that we can actually have anyone pay money for this. But paying attention to the weird nerds, weird nerds is a mixed bag because especially second, third generation game developers, game developers and designers who played games and are now making games, they'll often borrow elements from games naively. They'll borrow them because those elements felt good to them in a time and place, and they don't really understand what it was about those elements. You see this a lot, the most in MOBAs. Yeah, so MOBAs have brought so much baggage from the old days that I don't know if you can even separate it from the genre at this point. I don't know. So if you don't know, the first MOBAs, right, came from Dota, which was a Warcraft 3 mod. Again, a mod, right? And much in the way that all those other mods in for Quake were keeping things like ammo around, right? The mod for Warcraft 3 had to keep certain things because that's how Warcraft 3 worked, and you can only change so much in a mod, and you had mechanics like last hitting, Right? You can only get experience when you if you play the last hit to kill a guy. Now, now let's think about this for a Rin second. Rin does 90% of the damage, and then I poke him, and then I get all the, the gold and the treasure. What's the deal with last hitting? Like, does anyone actually like last hitting? Someone does. Yeah, someone definitely people does. People are really good at it. I mean, I liked Aerobiz. Right. There are but, people who like, you know, who don't like new Shira and they like Battle Demon. What purpose does last hitting spot, like serve in a game? What is it doing to the game? Or a better question, why is it there? It's there because all these MOBAs are based on a mod called Defense of the Ancients that had last hitting because that's how they made the mod. And then the community who played it was into that. They, that was If you changed it, those people would get mad. And like the tribes people, developers were listening to them, and unlike the Counter-Strike people, who had pe they didn't listen to the people who were telling them what to do with <laughs> Counter-Strike. And Counter-Strike is still around, and Tribes 2 is not. It's a little more subtle than that. Sometimes these things, like emergent gameplay, can actually really mess this equation up. Because it so happened that in a lot of the early MOBAs, if you removed last hitting, it removed an element that was of the game that was skill-based and difficult to execute. And if you remove that, the game became much less skill-based. So by removing some of these old elements, like being good at last hitting was a way to get better at the game once you'd achieved a certain plateau. Removing that element gave good players less room to grow. It gave the less, the fewer, like very skill-based avenues to expand your enjoyment of the game and to prove that you were a better player. So it became, because the game didn't offer other successful avenues of skill demonstration, last hitting became integral to being able to demonstrate your skill in the games. And simultaneously, people were used to it and would freak out if you took it away from them. Another way to look at this, if any of you play roguelikes, roguelikes are a very popular type of game, which is really just take an existing game and tweak it slightly so, like add rogue elements to the game. Has anyone ever actually played a rogue? Okay. Wow. Come rogue is not, you better don't play Rogue. If you have to play, if you want to go close to Rogue, just play NetHack, right? It's gonna be way better. So here's an example. There's something very interesting because when you use the term roguelike, normal people just say, oh, this game is roguelike because it's like Rogue. It has some of these elements. Right. Like The main feature of Rogue that people think of is A, procedural generation. So every time you play the game, you're gonna be getting a different map that the computer just generated, like a completely unique game, right? It's, you know, the map is different, the places you're gonna go are different. Right? The other thing is that when you die, it's game over, you have to generate a new game and start from scratch. Those are pretty much the two main things that people consider to be like roguelike. So what if I said you were objectively wrong because there was a conference where the Berlin Interpretation was authored? Do not read all that. The Berlin Interpretation 
is a very long document that explains all of these specific elements that make a game as like Rogue as possible with extremely detailed definitions so that you can objectively look at any game and say, how roguelike is this game? Right, a bunch of nerds are really upset that people were calling things like FTL roguelike, and they were like, no, it's not roguelike. It's not enough like Rogue. Right? <laughs> and they had to make a whole system to prove how, ro how like Rogue you are. Now there is a time and a place for this sort of thing. This is a very good job at distilling Rogue to its core components. It's a good exercise in semantics, I yeah. guess. Right? Sure. Taxonomy. Right. But it's not a good way to figure out which of those elements are poisonous. Right. If you're actually developing a game, you should not be using this as a guideline to say, this is, I should make my game according to this and follow all these rules. Right? Another thing that people tend to bring forward kind of often, uh, especially you know, with chiptunes, with pixel art, people will be nostalgic for a lot of things about a game. And sometimes the thing is the art, the context, stuff like this. So you'll be nostalgic toward pixel art and sprites because those are the games you grew up playing. So people make a game that looks pixely and you feel well inclined toward it. We're getting into the era where people might be nostalgic toward like old muddy PlayStation graphics, or they might be nostalgic toward the worst possible UX in human history. That is the Ravenloft game on the PC. It is a first-person D&D game that you should never play. Right. So on the one hand, technical limitations of old systems, old consoles, old game engines are often good because when you develop games with them, you're, those limitations bring about creativity. It's like, oh, well, I don't have enough memory to do the thing that I'm imagining. Let me creatively figure out a way to do something else, and something amazing appears, right? I was just at MAGFest and the composer of the Mega Man 2 music was there. And of course, the first question someone asked him was like, hey, you made the original music with like keyboards and guitars and drums and pianos, right? Like, how did you deal with the fact that you had to play that same music with an NES sound chip? And he's like, you know, uh, to begin with, right, it was sort of annoying that the NES really sounded garbagey compared to what I had originally composed. But he's like, but you know what, nowadays I like that Mega Man 2, you know, NES version more than the original, you know, whatever recordings that he had from the studio. Right? So the technical limitations can bring about creativity, but not always. <laughs> Sometimes they're just limitations and you couldn't do what you wanted. Right? So because we have that instance of technical limitations bringing about creativity doesn't mean that they always bring about creativity. There's plenty of times where it's like, well, your game was just, Metroid 1 was just worse than Super Metroid because you couldn't make the game big enough. <laughs> but I cannot stress this enough. Do not play this old Ravenloft game on the PC. <laughs> So I, let's go through briefly. We're going to look at a bunch of games and try to distill out of them what are their core elements. And because this is the nostalgia panel, I only pick games that one of the two of us is nostalgic for. So or that's both. the, that's like the privilege one. of being up on the stage, I guess. But Outlaw is an Atari game that I had deep memories of playing as a kid. I was obsessed with this game. And you know what? It's great. Yeah, it's I, still great. This game is still great. I was not obsessed with it as a kid, but I had played it. And then when we played it later in life, going back to it, it wasn't a He-Man situation. <laughs> this game is lit, right? All you do in this game is the two pretzel cowboys. And the two pretzel cowboys each have a gun. And all you got to do is shoot the other cowboy. And sometimes there's a cactus in a way, or a moving wagon or something, or a wall, or who knows what. Literally, all you do is shoot. You can bounce the bullets off the walls. At some, you can play with or without ammo. It's your choice. Pretty much it. The core elements of this game are like many Atari games, it is a very simple, direct competition game. Symmetric, simple, two player, fighting directly, the game's over when it's over, like Pong. Like that is an element to distill out of old Atari games because that element, even today, is super fun. It's really fun to play a really tight two player game. But don't draw other elements. You don't need to use, what, like 18 pixels yeah, to the, make the game? Right, the Western theme is not what made this game, right? <laughs> the, the letting people choose their own modes is not what made this game. The soundtrack did not make this game. I can, there I was can, no music. I can recreate the soundtrack for you right now. Pew! Pew! Yeah. We did a whole hour-long talk on Atari game design at a previous PAX. It's on YouTube, so we'll just move on. What was great about Super Mario 3? Like, Everything. Yeah. But specifically, like, what would we steal? What would we distill out of Super Mario 3? What did Super Meat Boy steal from Super Mario 3? I think that the best thing about Mario 3, and Mario 1 and 2 a little bit less so, right, is that the controls were so tight. And I learned, I, I remembered this again because on the plane here, I was playing new Mario Brothers U Deluxe on my Switch. 
And they intentionally, it seems, made the controls on new Mario U a little slippery, right? Even though you're not on ice, it feels like I'm on ice, right? It's like I stop, I let go of the right button and I expect Mario to just stop immediately. No, he keeps moving a little bit. You know, when I jump, the jump is a little bit meh, right? In Mario 3, it was on. You, you let go of right, you stop, right? You bear, unless you're in the ice level. Right, where it makes sense. Now this is tricky, this gets technical. This is something we can't get into the details of. Remember with Bionic Commando I talked about, they had to reverse engineer the exact movement and physics of the game because it felt so good. This is a side of game design a lot of people don't talk about like in public or panels or anything, but the math of exactly how your button presses interact with the game, that is a science, but it's also an art. You have to understand what feels good to players and be able to mathematically express that. And the shortest path to doing that is to find an old game that felt right and just copy it without knowing why, because you're copying such a tiny distilled element that you're unlikely to bring other baggage with you. Right. You're not gonna bring the weird pixel drawing on the right side of the screen along if you steal the timing on B button presses. Right, and think about that. You, put, you press the B button. There's a certain amount of lag, like fraction of a millisecond, before the computer can you know, know that you press the B button, and now it figures out, okay, Mario has to throw a fireball. That takes a certain amount of time. How long should the animation take before the fireball comes out? Right? How many frames of animation should you have? How fast should you play them? You've got 60 frames a second to work with. Right? How many frames are you going to spend with the fist? How many frames before the fireball appears? How, many, how fast is the fireball going to bounce forward? Right? All those things have to be timed so precisely to the millisecond or it will feel off. You won't be able to say why, but if I put 10 milliseconds of lag and you play Mario 3 and the fireball's a little delayed, you will know, unless you've never played Mario 3. My advice to game developers and designers out there, especially at indie studios, if there's a game that you're being a spiritual successor to, find a pro speedrunner of that game and hire them as a consultant. Like, I'm not even joking. That is the fastest way to get the exact All you feel. need to do is have them play it and say, no, it feels off. No, it feels off, feels right, right? It's like, if I, if, I, if I bake two batches of cookies, you can just sort of tell, right? Mm, something, this one needs a little, there's something different about this one. I can't say what, but this one's wrong. Chrono Trigger, the height and end of a genre in many ways. What, what could we steal from Chrono Trigger? Does anyone really like that grind? Like, no one wants to level up and... Does anyone no, like grinding? Do. People like grinding, yeah. There's got to be one, one, one dude people out there like likes it. grinding. Yeah, no, we're the only... Old, old people don't like it, but people like grinding. Was it the characters in the story? Probably. Kind of. I cared a lot about those characters. A little bit. I cared about them more than characters in other video games. Yeah. The big world... The million different environments, the, the, the scope and scale, similar to Earthbound. Earthbound and Chrono Trigger share one common element. Well, they share many elements, but one element that's important is that a sense of scale in what is a pretty simplistic gameplay gives you a lot in a game. If I would steal anything from Chrono Trigger, it was just that broad sense of scale. The world was big and the world was alive. Even though it wasn't alive, it was just a JRPG very similar to many other JRPGs. Mega Man 2, Scott's game. It's my game. I play so Mega Man 2 is nostalgic for me. Do we need the Berlin interpretation of Mega Man games? Oh, no, everyone knows what a Mega Man game is. What is a Mega Man game? Mega Man game, jump and shoot man. <laughs> That's it. Jump and shoot. Mega Man, done. There have to be enemies that are too low yeah. or too high for you to shoot without jumping. That's right. You also need to have at least nine people in a, in a ring that you can fight in any order you want. Mega Man 1 had less than nine. Yeah, that game sucks. <laughs> Mega Man 1 does kind of suck. It's not good. That's re there's a reason I had Mega Man 2 and 3, and I didn't have Mega Man 1. Also because Toys R Us didn't have Mega Man 1. Mega Man is an interesting situation because the distillate Mega Man games, what people like about Mega Man is so distilled that we're still making Mega Man games that are basically exactly the same as the old Mega Man games. If you took Mega Man 10 and went to me as a kid and handed it to me, I would lose at it just as badly as I lost in Mega Man 2 and I'd love every second. It is really interesting to see how they made Mega Man 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And it's like, okay, they're getting, you know, they got... Two, it's like they got better, right? But then they started getting a little not better, like six, seven, right? It's like it was still the same formula, but there was just something about it. Like no one's going to – maybe someone will say Mega Man 7 is better than 2, but I don't think so, right? But it's interesting to know that once – they, they went, you know, they went off and didn't make Mega Man's for a while. And when they came back with 9, 10, 11, they went back, right? They, they went back to what was originally done in the olden days. They didn't, you know, keep making it fancier and fancier. And it's also, they had Mega Man X, which is sort of like this, we, all right, we'll make a separate thing where we can do the fanciness and keep upgrading, right? It was like a separate outlet for their desire to make, you know, a game where they actually update the technology. So if I had to distill one core element out of Mega Man, it would be the fact that 
Mega Man games, to a fault, will introduce elements of gameplay and challenges in a very specific and preordained fashion. They'll show you a thing, and you'll see how it works. Then they'll show you the thing, and now you have to deal with it, but there's nothing else in the way. You can deal with that thing. Then they show you the thing with a complication, like now it's at the top of a ladder. Then they have 10 of that thing. They give you this very specific progression to learn how to play the game. Right, and a lot of games do that. You know, Mario games do that, but Mega Man does it with nine levels to choose from, and each level has its own different thing. And then if you do the levels in certain orders, you'll get items that let you creatively get around. It's like, all right, here's a simple moving platform. Here's a really dangerous moving platform. I got my own platforms, thank you. I'll just I'll jump over here. Yeah. <laughs> I will blow through a bunch of these quickly. Super Dodgeball, old NES game versus competition. The pro just like that Atari game, the problem with a lot of these old versus NES games, everything you distill out of this game is kind of bad. Because if you actually get good at a lot of these games, there's no more skill. You're both equally good, the game is random, or the game literally never ends. There's almost nothing you can steal from this game. All of its core mechanics break down upon further scrutiny. Right. GoldenEye Halo. I'm going to argue the only thing to borrow from Halo 1 or GoldenEye on the N64 is that these are the first experiences most people had playing multiplayer FPSs. Right. People had this huge nostalgia for GoldenEye. A lot of people do, right? And the reason is that when GoldenEye came out, you don't realize on the PC, that was the time when there was the, the Mega TFs and everything. Right? Yeah, I was playing Weapons Factory, and I'd look at this like, what the hell is this nonsense? Right. Who's it was, playing this? GoldenEye was like this because of the limitations of the N64, but... People weren't playing Weapons Factory because you needed a crazy PC and you needed to be a crazy nerd who knew what IP addresses were in order to play multiplayer Weapons Factory. I know. This was the first multiplayer FPS that was actually accessible to people that you could actually get and play without having to be a computer nerd. So the core element to draw from these games is the fact that you're playing an FPS against someone else in the same room. Nothing about the actual gameplay was that notable in the era. Now I said Halo 1 specifically. I don't want. I'm not trying to. Crap all over later Halos. Talk about the first one. Right. When Halo 1 came out, we were already playing Counter-Strike. <sighs> I don't even know if I want to. I don't like MOBAs. We don't like MOBAs. I've always hated them. I like the core of MOBAs, right? It's like you're on a team. You're working together to, to, to fight in this isometric view to go destroy the thing on the other side, right? You got these lanes. The basic parts I like, but every single MOBA does a lot of things I don't like. We already talked about last hitting. Like complicated item trees, a million heroes to keep track of, trying to remember what all their powers are. Lots of the powers are really annoying, like haha, you're frozen, or haha, I'm invisible, or ha, it's like I can't deal with all that. I think what people like though, an element I would distill out of all MOBAs is posturing. The idea that all these games are in their essence, once people are good, is you've got a bunch of people who are kind of like edging toward each other with very powerful weapons and backing off a little bit and edging forward, and then someone edges forward a little too far, and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> That is the most fun part of MOBA, so that's the part you gotta distill out. These games aren't actually that fun in a modern era. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't play the King's Quest 1, I'm not that old. I played like the later ones with the, where you click the mouse and you right click to change the cursor to be like the eyeball and the, the finger and the sword and all the other different yeah, things. Yeah, or like Quest those, for Glories. Yeah, those are a little bit easier to play than King's Quest 1. But the thing is, for these games, I feel like most people remember like the story that was so epic, right? The adventure part. But actually playing the games these days is really annoying and unfun, right? You have to remember these obtuse puzzles and obtuse sequence of actions just to continue the story. It would be better off as a movie. Yep, or in inter you know, entertainment software. Make it more like a game where you click to make the story continue, click to make things happen, move around. A thing you explore. Distill that out, but don't actually make it puzzles. Just make it an interactive or at least make good puzzles. <laughs> make it a game as opposed to a game. Use a different definition of game. Metroidvanias. Yeah. What, what's, what's the one thing about Metroidvanias? That well, there's, I think there's two me. things about Metroidvanias, right? I said like, one. But too bad. <laughs> there's, there's the get item to access new area thing going on, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, it's like I can't get, I see some dangerous place with lava, I can't get through there. Then you get the various suit and you're like, yes, you can finally go through that lava without dying. Yes, and you can explore this whole giant map, right? And I think the other thing is just like you said about Chrono Trigger, the bigness, right? Super Metroid, even today, if you play it casually, feels big. Like, that map is enormous. Symphony of the Night, it's a double map. This whole <laughs> thing is upside down on top of itself. It's huge, right? And I've seen a lot of new Metroidvania games 
and they're just not big. It's like, dude, you don't have the memory limits of a Super Nintendo cartridge anymore. Why don't you make a game that's like five times as large as Super Metroid? You don't need to make more mechanics. Just make the map insanely big so I could spend like a year exploring it, right? But newer Super Metroidvania games, even if they're good, like say Hollow Knight, not really as big. You know, it's like people well, need it in a They distill time. different elements out of it. This yeah. comes back to that know your audience thing. Do you want Scott to spend money or do you want someone else to spend money? Dance Dance Revolution. Of all the rhythm games, with ex except Dance Rush, because it's too new, we can't we talk about it. Dance Rush. Anyone know where a Dance Rush machine is? Anybody? Yeah? Anybody? <laughs> Anyone know where an arcade is? Yeah. <laughs> Dance Dance Revolution, the thing you distill out of it is that unlike all the other rhythm games, this one is the closest to actual dancing and moving, while still being primarily a game with score and skill. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there, like say, Para Para Paradise, right? It's like, okay, it mostly exists to teach you all these para para dances for old Japanese clubs where they used yeah, to just dance. Be a trend, You're learning right? like real dance. Like, it gives you a score, but no one gives a crap about the score, right? DDR, it's like okay, it leans a little bit more towards the score side. The score matters, but you're still you're still moving, right? And then you got down the other end, you got pop and music, which is just score, no dance, you just hit buttons, right? That's worthless. DDR is like this only game that's right in the middle. Right where it belongs, and there's also pop or whatever, not pop and music, pump. Pump. Pump with the five buttons instead of four buttons. I just don't like five buttons. It turns out it doesn't matter where the buttons are. <laughs> Dig Dug, old arcade games. Mm -hmm. What do we steal from old arcade games? Because actually, a lot of our old arcade games, modern remakes of them tend to get it wrong. Old arcade games are designed to go on forever and to steal your money. They didn't actually have to be that good. They just had to steal your quarters. Right. People are nostalgic for these for a lot of the same reasons I was nostalgic for He-Man, right? It's like because you played it when you were young and put a bunch of quarters in it, you have these fond memories, but actually the games are not that good. But I think what you steal is aesthetics and simplicity, but never try to remake the mechanics of most of these old arcade games. The mechanics were there usually due to technical limitations. Like, Dig Dug is actually one of the ones that's actually a good game compared to, say, like, Space Invaders. It's like, no, you need to do a lot to Space Invaders to fix it. You need to make a more modern schmuck, like an Ikaruga kind of situation. Natural Selection. Anybody this is an ever old played one. this at all? The old Natural Selection. Right, you played Subnautica? More people played? All right. It's these, this is the first game they made. The Subnautical people made this first. It's a mod for Half-Life 1, if you can believe it. Uh, the weapon and, doesn't look like it, but all the other stuff does. Yep, they and there is a that, sequel, Natural Selection 2, that's out right now. They push that engine to the limit. This game is an RTS and an FPS. It is the dream. One person is playing an RTS, looking at the map with a top-town view, giving orders, building things, and then people playing an FPS are going around building the things and following the orders. You can be either one. But... If I had to distill something out of this game, because the game did, ended up being not that fun unless you had the right group of people in it. The thing that I would distill out of this game, the thing I'm actually nostalgic for, is the time and place and people I played it with. The community I played the game with was the magic. The game just happened to work for that community. If you took a different community of gamers and threw them in this game, it tended to be a kind of awful experience. Yeah, no, there were times in which the game got crazy popular, and then servers, some servers would be good, some servers would be bad. Right? It was all about finding the right people who were playing the game the right way, and if you had those people playing a different game, that game would have been good too. But that implies something terrifying. The core nostalgic element of a game might not actually be the game itself. It might be something outside of the game. So what about those Koshi Musawa, like there's a map and a million numbers on them games that I love inexplicably. That's all you. <laughs> Don't play these games. No. These, there's almost nothing to borrow from these games. These games are literally just a product of the limitations of the hardware at the time. If you're going to remake these games, take characters and story and make a completely different game. But no one remembers the characters and story, so maybe just move on and make a different game entirely. I love these games. I would never actually try to get anyone to play them with me. Mario Kart's as a whole. Yeah. What's, what's fun about Mario Kart? What is the one sentence explanation of well, what's fun? I think for different people, there's like there's two classes of people who play Mario Kart, right? There's people who just want to have fun party time with their friends, and for those people, it doesn't matter which Mario Kart you play. And in fact, the Double Dash one might be the best one in the GameCube because you can get that co-op action going on, right? But then there's other people who play Mario Kart who actually care about racing and winning. And for those people, you need to play the GBA Mario Kart, because that is the only skill-based Mario it's Kart. It's the Fox-only Final Destination version. Yes. So last and least, Civilization 2, because this is where we're going to get into our broader points. we got about six minutes left to drive our point home. 
I probably played more hours of Civilization 2 than I have played any game in my entire life with the possible exception of Tribes 2. I don't know if I can say that, but I can say when I had Civ 2, I played it usually late into the night every night. But how would you play Civ 2? And I'm going to paraphrase because I remember how Scott played Civ 2. <laughs> I played it in a very bad way. Scott would basically put himself on a giant island. Because you could custom, you could make custom maps in Civ 2. By himself. Yep. And just play for hours making a giant civilization uncontested. Yep. Meanwhile, the rest of the civilizations are on like crappy islands by themselves on the other side of the world. Yep. And then I would go with boats and destroy it. <laughs> I would just play the game. I would just make a world and just play until the end, hours and hours and hours forever. And when I think back, what I was actually doing, like the thing I was getting out of this game, was killing time. Because I was in high school. I literally had nothing better to do. So the time that you played a game and the context in which you play it is one of the most important things in determining what you enjoyed about a game and what you're nostalgic for. It's not just the game itself, it's what was the game, what else was out? What else could you play at the same time as this game? Civ 2 is not a game to play today, but back then when I was in high school, there was nothing else like it except Civ 1 that was not worth playing. All right, so you're making a game, and if your audience for that game has a lot of free time, like high school kids in the 90s, your game can do really well. You could make the game, same exact game, so much better than the original game, objectively. You improve every aspect of the game, but your audience is now 30-year-old people who don't have free time. Guess what? your game's not gonna sell now, even though it's objectively vastly superior to the original. And it's not even just what your life was like, because there was a time in my life where I had no responsibilities, enough money to survive, and I just played games all day, every day. So I would play a lot of games that weren't actually that fun per unit hour spent playing them, but I had a lot of time to kill. So I was also different. The Scott that would sit and play Civ 2 as a game where he just kind of pokes at it for four hours, I don't think that Scott exists anymore. No, that Scott died. That Scott's dead. He died a long time ago. Yeah. So if that Rim and Scott died, and then someone remakes the game that we keep saying we, they, we, that we want them to remake, that we're not here to play the game. You can think about like we're a legacy version, right? So it's like the old me died, and the new me now exists, but the only thing that was carried over was this memory. I like that thing, but nothing else was carried over. So as much as I want Tribes 2 to be remade, I don't think it ever can be because what I want out of Tribes 2 isn't just that gameplay. Because there are games that I are 90% there. I would need to also there. somehow, it would need to change my body to make me 20-something years old and put me in college with lots of free time in addition to being Tribes 2. Yep. And if a game studio can make that, they, <laughs> that is... I don't think they need to make games. They could just make... <laughs> At that point, I think they've made a cult. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so to get all the way back to the slide in the beginning, those games, I don't know if I've seen people talking about these kinds of Tiger Electronics games nostalgically. They literally only existed because that was the best technology to entertain children in the backseat of a car before real video games existed. That's me. Before you didn't have a Game Boy, you didn't have enough Game Boys for all your kids, you could afford these things. We're even older, we didn't even have those. I had these little plastic things with like ball bearings in them that you'd shoot around. I had those too, but we also had, I had that Sonic 3 one actually specifically. I, I, I eventually saved up and got a Game Gear. I had a Street Fighter 2 also, that was the great best one. So, in the last hour... Why do you keep using this slide? I love this slide. Also, AGDQ had a really good Simon's Quest speedrun. Where did we go? What's the point of all this? One... When you play games, you need to be able to explain to yourself and understand what are the core elements of that game. Right. What is it? This game has a lot of stuff going on, especially if it's a modern game and it's not Outlaw, but what is the part of the game that we're actually enjoying? What makes this game different from oh, the no, other Oh, no, 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 you're getting ahead of me. What's what about? are the core elements? And then separately, of those elements, which one actually made it unique? A lot of platformers, but what was special about that one? It might be nothing. Yeah. There might be nothing unique about this game. There are games that I like that but aren't if special. A, if there's a game you like, it might have something special and unique about it. Was it just that you played that one first? What did you personally and specifically like about that game? Like, I'm not going to tell this is Kaboom, an Atari game that I like, but I know in detail exactly what specifically I liked about this game, and I know that I will never recapture that. It might be that you think the game is good simply because of you, not because of anything to do with the game. To be a better person, let's get outside of gaming, let's make it all serious TED Talk style. If you want to be a better person, introspect. Understand why you like things. Many people are unwilling to do this. And even more difficult, understand why other people like things you don't like. We don't like MOBAs. We hate MOBAs. I don't hate them, but I hate I'm, them. I'm just, I don't I do them. hate them. Okay. <laughs> 
that's fine. My opinion is okay. I shouldn't go bother you about why you like MOBAs. I know why you like Just MOBAs. Just because Rim hates MOBAs doesn't mean you're a bad person if you don't agree with him. If you don't like someone else's game, you should understand why they like that game, because then you'll have a deep insight into their darkest soul. <laughs> and even more importantly, if you don't like a game, you should be able to explain exactly why you don't like it. Otherwise, you're just I a hater. It because I got out of a hole and then I walked and then I wasn't trying to fall <laughs> in the hole, but I fell in the hole anyway. Also, this game is way better than you think. So if you understand why you like games, you'll know more about yourself, you'll be a better gamer, you'll be a better person, and we're out of time. I hope you enjoyed this. Come see us in one hour to learn to play Carcassonne. Or don't. If you want to see videos of dozens of other talks we've given, including that Atari Game Design one, grab one of these vintage flyers from 2006. You'll learn what a podcast is. These will explain to you in detail what a podcast is and what a podcatcher is. Does anyone even call them podcatchers no, anymore? No, 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 no. <laughs>